Evgeny Prigozhin, the fearsome chief of Russia's Wagner mercenaries, is now believed to be dead after his plane was blown out of the sky on Wednesday evening. I just want to bring you some breaking news. Ten people have been killed in a private jet crash north of Moscow. The Russian civil aviation... In a televised meeting yesterday, President Putin sent his condolences to the families of the dead and described Prigozhin as a talented businessman. Putin looked impassive talking into the camera. He certainly wasn't grief-stricken for his former friend. But then, over the last few months, Prigozhin had become more of a foe. In June, he led the Wagner Group march on Moscow in what looked like an attempted coup. And he seemed to be willing to openly criticise Russia's leadership. With regard to the fact that Russia's soldiers are fleeing the trenches, it's not a problem with the soldiers. The problem has to do with the people who are managing them. The fish rots from the head. Vladimir Putin is known for treating revenge as a dish best served cold, possibly with a side of poison. So why did this happen now, and in such a spectacular fashion? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, the events leading up to the death of Evgeny Prigozhin. My name's Alida Naylor. I have been freelancing with The Times for about a year now, but I started working on Russia in around 2011, which was when I first moved to St. Petersburg to study for my master's. Alida was one of the journalists trying to piece together information as the story broke on Wednesday. She's a Times contributor specialising in Russia. And I am the author of the book The Shadow in the East, Vladimir Putin and the New Baltic Front. A leader on Wednesday, for any Russia watcher, it was a phenomenal moment. Just describe to us what you first understood about what was happening. The first email I sent to the foreign desk was understatement of the century. It was business jet crash into their oblast. I knew something was brewing there, but I think one of the first people to kind of unofficially pin the crash to Prigozhin was Ksenia Sobchak who is a Russian television personality, but she's also connected to Putin by her father, who was Putin's political mentor in the 1990s. And I found it very curious that she was putting that out there. She must have been quite confident to do that and probably has the connections to have had some prescient understanding of what was going on. And as the details emerge, just talk us through what you were learning about the flight that had crashed. So we had an idea. Again, everything was very unconfirmed. We had to be very, very careful reporting this. We learned that the private Embraer legacy aircraft was one of two Wagner jets in Russian skies. We knew that it crashed 180 miles north of Moscow, flying from Moscow to St. Petersburg. He was on the passenger list for the plane and there was video footage. We could hear eyewitnesses at the scene reporting that they heard two loud noises before the crash. There were 10 people on board in total, seven passengers, three crew members, and the flight radar data showed that the plane had been ascending prior to the crash, which was interesting. In terms of those two loud noises, do we know what caused the crash? Initially, there were reports that it may have been shut down, but now the understanding is that it could have been explosions on board. It's also being investigated by Russia's investigative committee, SLEDCOM, but I doubt that investigation will publicly yield any trustworthy results. So perhaps we won't ever know the real answer. And do we know who was on board the plane? So along with Prigozhin, Dmitry Utkin, who was his deputy, this skinhead neo-Nazi type guy, lots of tattoos, he was on there too. This is the man who, who helped to form Wagner. Yes, exactly. We also had an understanding that there may have been a second jet in the sky. So that's when you start to doubt whether Prigozhin might have been on the jet or not. 
Tess said he was on the passenger list for the plane and that obviously left some room for understanding that he may not have actually been on the flight. He was just on the passenger list. Taz is the Russian news agency, so they're reporting that Prigozhin's name is on the manifest of not the other plane in the air, but the plane that has crashed. Yes. And there was some early speculation from people who've been spokespeople for Putin in the past, um, supporters of his, who seem to suggest that this was Ukraine that had brought the plane down. The closest we ever really get to a voice of the Kremlin is from Sergei Markov. He's a Russian political scientist and formerly a close advisor to Vladimir Putin. He tends to know what's going on in Moscow. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning. So my version is that the Ukrainian authorities kill Evgeny Prigozhin and it's gift to the uh, Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky to the Independence Day of Ukraine, which they celebrate today. Exactly. So, you're, so you're saying they've celebrated their Independence Day by taking out uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. How could Ukrainian forces take out a plane? What do you make of that? I mean, I don't want to speculate when we don't have the full information here. And we do know that Ukraine is capable, or at least people connected to Ukraine. I don't want to say the Ukrainian state, because they frequently deny any connection to sabotage attempts inside Russia. But we know that Ukraine does have a network of sympathetic people inside Russia. It's possible. I think personally that it's more likely to have been coming from the Russian state. So much of this seems to come down to the relationship between these two men, between Putin and Prigozhin, and they go back a long way. Just remind us a bit about their relationship in the early years, you know, in the run-up to the invasion of Ukraine. We know that Putin and Prigozhin have a long history together, and the reason that he was known as Putin's chef is simply because Putin trusted him enough to reward his loyalty with big catering contracts. He started out as a violent thug, a hot dog salesman and convicted thief, and had a relationship with Putin in St. Petersburg before Putin became president. So back when he was a KGB officer, Putin kind of recognised Prigozhin's sense of initiative, which would apparently later become his downfall. And this symbiotic relationship has always contained a sort of element of trust insofar as there can be trust between such people. Prigozhin's Concord company won very big catering contracts from the Russian state and his business was soon feeding school children and soldiers across Russia. And soon he ends up setting up a mercenary company, which which helps the state, but without being directly linked to them. Yeah, one thing I want to make very clear is that Prigozhin was not a good person. So I, I don't know if you saw the New York Post referring to him as a dissident. He was anything but... His crew of Wagnerites were marauders and rapists, and it was yeah. probably useful for Putin to have somebody like this around with plausible deniability. But Prigozhin was reported to have pitched a plan to Putin about how to promote Russian interests around the world without implicating the Kremlin, forming Wagner around 2014. And it had a history of being very active in Africa, in Libya, Central African Republic, Syria, Mali, and its activities aligned with the Kremlin's political and economic goals, such as the exploitation of raw materials. But it's also been accused by the US, UK, UN of human rights violations and disinformation campaigns on the African continent. And Prigozhin has been denying his connection to Wagner's activities across the 2010s. It was last year that we saw Prigozhin publicly admitting his role with Wagner and openly attempting to recruit people from Russian prisons. <laughs> So we saw a video footage of him standing in a prison yard offering men freedom or death, saying anyone surviving six months on the Ukrainian front lines would be freed, but anyone deserting would be executed. So at this stage, you know, by the time the Ukraine war comes around, Wagner has become an illicit but vital part of Russia's military armory. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, helps to extend Russia's global reach. But then Wagner suddenly makes global headlines at the end of June thanks to an unprecedented coup attempt by the group as they march towards Moscow. 
It has, by any estimation, been an extraordinary last 24 hours in Russia. There's been a dramatic escalation in tensions between Russia's military and the Wagner mercenary group, raising fears it could lead to a civil war in Russia. Right now, we have crossed the state borders in all directions. But then, this evening, there was a sudden change, and the crisis seemed to be over. Just remind us, what prompted the attempted coup? Was this a big falling out with Putin? In the lead up to the aborted coup, or mutiny rather, we saw Prigozhin becoming increasingly frustrated with the failures of the Russian armed forces in Ukraine. But I think he was also frustrated with the lack of recognition being afforded to Wagner and him personally from among Russia's political elite. So Prigozhin and Wagner has always kind of operated outside the system. I believe that he felt shafted and ignored by the Russian establishment despite feeling responsible for some of Russia's only battlefield successes, for example, in Bakhmut, which is one of the key flashpoints in eastern Ukraine, Mm. while the rest of Russia's invasion has kind of been floundering. And amid these reports of mass deaths and poorly supplied troops, in the lead up to the mutiny, we saw him attempting to cultivate his own public profile via pro-war military bloggers or telegram channels. And opening his own patriotic startup hub in St. Petersburg. And he, I think Prigozhin kind of realized how to adapt to modern systems of distributing information in a way that the constrained official Russian media environment can't do. Yeah. And through these kind of new channels available to him, he cultivated the Prigozhin personality to become more of a figure in his own right. And it worked. And a lot of that was through these video clips, often from the battleground, which, you know, was viewed millions of times or passed around created an image of him as the soldier, the effective leader on the ground. But he was becoming increasingly bold in criticising Putin in them. So he never initially directly appeared to attack Putin in his videos. So his gripes tended to be with people further down the chain of command. But we did start to see increasing criticism in the run-up to the coup. So in May, he referred to an ambiguously termed happy old man. A happy old man thinks he's doing well. What should the country do next? And how should we win the war if it turns out by chance? I just assume that this man is a complete asshole. So that that seemed like an implicit attack on Putin. So this is sort of implying that Putin didn't really know what was happening on the ground. It's possible, yeah. And also there were suggestions that he did start to fear for his life in June, so... This is, again, highly speculative, but it's possible that he orchestrated the mutiny because he felt cornered by his remaining options. Also, it's around this time that volunteer units in Ukraine were going to be required to sign contracts with Russia's defence ministry, which would have made Prigozhin quite resentful. He was used to having his independence. So that would have meant the Wagner Group becoming part of the Russian military rather than being Prigozhin's empire. It would have been absorbed into the Russian power vertical. And then you have this attempted coup. What's Putin's reaction to it. So it wasn't until June 25th, which was two days after the aborted mutiny started, that Putin decided to release a video address. Putin blasted the treasonous actions of the group, saying the mutiny was a knife in the back and a betrayal of the Russian people, and he didn't mention Prigozhin by name which is kind of a dishonour that Putin reserves for his most reviled opponents in order to imply they're not worthy of his attention. Really? And yet clearly there is a sense of betrayal there. And people who betray Putin don't generally tend to last long. What happened to Prigozhin after the coup? He allegedly moved to Belarus, and we have photographs and footage of Prigozhin from the immediate aftermath of the coup, purportedly from a Wagner camp in Belarus. Welcome to hell! He gave a rousing speech in his first video appearance on July 19th, proclaiming to a circle of Wagner fighters in Belarus that what was happening on Russia's front lines was a disgrace in which they did not need to participate. And it was reportedly um, Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko who helped negotiate and organise Prigozhin's exile there. And the presence of Wagner troops has since started to concern neighbouring countries such as Poland and Lithuania. Lithuania actually recently closed its border with Belarus, I believe. Because they're afraid of Wagner. Exactly. Poland also transferred around 1,000 troops eastwards after this happened. 
And we all assumed at the time that this meant he'd been banished, that he wouldn't be back in Russia. Yeah, surprisingly, he was later recorded as having been in both Russia and Africa since the coup and was even photographed at the St. Petersburg Russia Africa summit last month, shaking hands with a Central African Republic presidential advisor. And then it also emerges that although he's supposed to be banished to Belarus, there was this long three hour meeting in the Kremlin between Putin, Prigozhin, and some of the leadership from Wagner. Tell us about that. It was really, really surprising to hear about that because obviously Prigozhin was exiled in Belarus and the fact that he's still having meetings inside Russia is kind of wild to hear, especially with somebody who has labelled him very publicly a traitor. It sounds like the meeting was maybe more to do with dividing up Wagner and the fighters that were loyal versus the fighters that weren't necessarily loyal. So there were fighters who accompanied Prigozhin there and I think Putin was trying to get Wagner troops on board and maybe get them to operate within the command structure of Russia's defence ministry too or within the Kremlin's power vertical in some way instead of remaining with Prigozhin possibly. But it clearly didn't work. On Tuesday, leaders from Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa met in Johannesburg for the BRICS summit, a meeting of emerging economic powerhouses. It's the sort of summit where world leaders really want to be there in person to reassure allies and to win people over. But for Vladimir Putin, that wasn't possible, as he has an international arrest warrant hanging over him. So, in another sign of weakness, he had to stay at home. Our next speaker is the President of the Russian Federation, His Excellency President Vladimir Putin, who, while he's not able to be with us, will address us via video. Dear President Ramaphosa, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm pleased to greet the government and business representatives at the same time, this video emerges showing Evgeny Prigozhin on the ground in Africa, being the great leader who's going to fix Africa's problems, recruiting. Tell us a bit about that video. It was released just two days before his death, and he was posing with a rifle in a kind of desert. Wagner PMC conducts reconnaissance and search actions, makes Russia even greater on all continents and Africa more free. Justice and happiness for the African people, we are making life a nightmare for ISIS. We can't actually confirm that he was in Africa at the time that that video footage was released. So who knows what the delay is between releasing video footage and actually being present somewhere. Mm. Our South Africa correspondent said that flight tracking data placed Prigozhin's plane in Mali last week and it actually travelled back to Moscow via Damascus on August the 21st. And yet the timing of the release of that video, again, will have annoyed the Kremlin. It might be something of a middle finger, yeah. <laughs> and then, perhaps unsurprisingly, within hours, Prigozhin's plane crashes. And, you know, for many, I suppose the biggest surprise was that he'd survived as long as he did. Why do you think Putin hadn't acted sooner? Something kind of notable about this is Putin loves his anniversaries. And this did happen on the two-month anniversary oh. <laughs> of the initial coup. So that could be related. Putin's become a little more pragmatic, I think. or He's, he's become slightly more cautious, let's say. And I think maybe it took a little planning. Again, if it was Putin, you know, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> there aren't many people taking that bet now. <laughs> yeah. And Prigozhin isn't the only one who's vanished this week. After the attempted coup, it does feel like this was the week that we had the final cleanup. In the space of a week, we've lost potentially Prigozhin, the man who founded Wagner with him, and some very important generals. Talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, since the aborted mutiny, there have been some mysterious deaths. I mean, there, there are always mysterious deaths. But it was just last week that Colonel General Gennady Zhitko, who is 57 years old, a former deputy defense minister, he died in Moscow following a quote-unquote long illness. 
he was sanctioned last year by the UK, I believe, and removed from his post last October. And he was replaced with Sergei Surovikin. Surovikin has not been seen since Prigozhin's Wagner Rebellion, amid ambiguous official statements about his being on holiday. But just the day before the crash, he was officially removed from his position. So that was very interesting timing. So it does feel like this has been the week where Putin is finally, on the two-month anniversary, cleaning up all the loose ends from that attempted coup. Where does all of this now leave the Wagner group? What happens to them? It could go either way. I mean, obviously, they've been deprived of two very important leaders, but... The Wagner channels have been saying things like, we will avenge this, march on the Kremlin, kill all traitors from the Ministry of Defence. We have other commanders who will obey and we'll operate according to Wagner regulations. What's happened has happened. We have to stay together. And we have also seen Russian security forces on high alert in Rostov-on-Don. That's the southern city where Wagner was greeted with a kind of rock star welcome during the mutiny. So there is a chance we could see another coup? I mean, it's possible that this is going to stir some discontent inside Russia, for sure. But establishment figures, again, we've mentioned Ksenia Sobchak already, the Russian television personality. She's said that Wagner has been decapitated. So it's possible that there's this kind of confidence now amongst the... Russian establishment figures that maybe everything's finished, everything's okay. For Putin, has he managed to come out looking stronger or has he been damaged by the whole affair? I mean, will he be seen as as a bit erratic and a bit desperate? Yes. <laughs> He's being perceived as being both stronger and weaker, in my opinion. He's getting older. People are talking about succession. Russia is still kind of doing poorly in Ukraine and Ukraine's counteroffensive is making small gains. But this was definitely a very, very big statement to people who might currently be questioning his power. Who wants to risk the same ending as Prigozhin? You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, Times contributor, freelance journalist and author, Alida Naylor. You can keep up with all the latest developments in Russia on The Times app or at thetimes.co.uk with a subscription, including analysis from our diplomatic editor about why Putin is becoming more violent and taking Russia back to the performative violence of the 1930s. The producer today was Sam Chantarasak, and the executive producer was James Shield. Thanks for listening. Have a lovely weekend. (laughs) 